Okay, for beginners. So this is uh, hopefully uh, very painless, but what I'd like to do is uh, uh, invite people for discussion on these afterwards. So the first thing I thought I'd do is tell you what a tuner isn't or ain't. Um, there's a guitar tuner. Uh, if you are a little tone deaf or not sure how to tune a guitar, you can actually buy this little uh, device that will show you if you're in tune or not. For It, it actually tweaks each, each string uh, individually. And uh, that that is actually tuning the strings. So that's a real tuner. Uh, I have a stepper vertical, which has a little element and it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a little copper or actually beryllium alloy wire, which is the element or copper beryllium strip, which goes through this, this stepper uh, motor uh, device. And it actually lengthens or shortens that length, depending on the frequency you want to transmit on. That's a real antenna tuner, okay? Because it sets the wire length or the element length appropriately to be resonant at a certain frequency. An antenna tuner is a different thing. Oh, and by the way, I play banjo five string and we have tuners as well. And uh, they allow you to go, um, there's a cam inside a little device on the on the uh, peg head that allows you to detune to another uh, key. And then you just twist it back up to the stop and you're back in your original key. So uh, there's all kinds of tuners. This is sort of the original standard picture of a Johnson Viking uh, matchbox. Um, yeah, Peter recognizes this. I had one, and now, now uh, Jim V6JF, who's on here, I think he's the proud owner of it. I still um, have one. Who's that? That's Bud. I still have one. Okay. Yeah, they're uh, um, in their day, they were just about everywhere. And, and in fact, I don't think anyone has ever thrown one away. So uh, uh, they're just uh, too good, uh, they, or the, uh, the components in them are, are usable in so many other projects. Anyway, the, a better definition of what an antenna tuner is, is a matching unit or a match box. But Johnson uh, took out the term or patented, I think, uh, match box. So we don't call them match boxes other than for a, uh, this unit here. We, tend to refer to them as an ATU or an antenna tuning unit. So that's what you'll see typically now as an ATU. And all it's supposed to do is match the source impedance, which is usually the output of a rig, to the antenna or to the, uh, the feed line and then to the antenna. So it's matching the output uh, uh, to the input and to minimize the loss in between. That's all they do. <clears throat> All right, so do you need one? Well, one of the things that uh, antennas are good at is resonating at a particular frequency. Or if they're a, uh, a tunable antenna, they can uh, be tuned like a stepper at various frequencies. But typically, if you have a dipole or an inverted V or a whip, uh, they're resonant at one frequency. And as you go away from that, center frequency, the impedance will change. So uh, if it's within a certain range, then your transmitter will be able to handle it. So your transmitters typically output an impedance of 50 ohms. And then um, as you get beyond an SWR of about two to one, some are a little more forgiving than others, uh, your power will start to go down, the power that is being output from your radio, so as to protect the radio itself or the finals. Um, and, uh, and so you may find that you have an antenna which is not usable by your rig because the SWR where you want to use it is outside that range. So that may be a good reason to get an antenna tuner or to get a a better solution would be to get another antenna that's resonant where you want to use it, so you don't need a tuner. Um, if you go to uh, a place like uh, uh, Gord's V6SV, who I believe is uh, listening in, uh, he's got resonant antennas for every band, 
but uh, the 40 meter Yagi he has is pretty much resonant for the low end of the band and not in the high end of the band, I believe that's the situation. So he has an antenna tuner on that particular Yagi just when we're doing a certain uh, sideband contest, we might need it. Uh, anyway, so sometimes you do need a tuner. Uh, if you're using random wire antennas, you definitely will need a tuner. And where do you place the tuner? Uh, typically uh, between your, your transmitter or transceiver and the feed line and antenna. Now, as uh, Peter said, says in the class, we've already discussed this a little bit, the best place is at the base of the antenna, but that would require a remote tuner with uh, the ability to, uh, to tune it in the shack, but you're actually uh, controlling it outside somewhere uh, near the antenna. That will actually uh, help you with, with the impedance mismatch at the antenna. But typically we keep them in the shack and typically nowadays the modern regs all have an SWR meter built in and most uh, ATUs have a built in meter as well. So uh, one of the um, mistakes newbies often make is they, if they are using an external tuner uh, with their modern transceiver, they forget to turn off the tuner that's in the rig itself. You don't want to be tuning a tuner because then they're going to fight each other and uh, not give you the best solution. So let the transceiver um, think it's it's uh, feeding a 50 ohm load and then let the external antenna tuner do the, the rest of the work. Okay, so there's two kinds and then there's two types or whatever, two types and and we'll get into another few different types, if that makes any sense. Uh, so there's an automatic and a manual type tuner. Most modern rigs have an automatic one in there. You press a button, it says tune, and voila, after some clicking and buzzing or whatever noise it makes, uh, because it's usually going through a bunch of relays, um, you will be tuned and then the light will go off or something will say tuned and you'll be able to uh, use that antenna most efficiently. Uh, and a lot of the more expensive radios or, or tuners have memories built in. So once you've tuned it for that frequency, it'll remember it and go back to that uh, memory setting the next time it's on that frequency. So if you set it for 7.025, <clears throat> excuse me, um, next time you're on that same frequency, it'll try to use what's in the, its memory to set the uh, the uh, tuner up without wasting too much time trying to get a, a good tune. There's also um, a manual, uh, the earlier versions were all manual, uh, which requires you doing the tuning. Uh, and you may not have a unique uh, combination. What they're actually doing, if you recall in the classes, uh, talking about inductive reactants and capacitive reactants, you're actually moving the uh, both reactances and uh, trying to get a cancellation of the reactants. So it's purely resistive load, a 50 ohm resistive load uh, as, as far as what the transmitter thinks it's seeing. So there may not be a unique solution. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but it can be uh, a little frustrating to figure that out depending on the type of tuner that you're using. But the good news is you can write it down. Bud would probably do this. Uh, we write it down the settings for XL and XC. And next time you need to use, you're on that band or on that frequency of that band, you just look up your chart and you know where to set the thing. The good thing about manual ones is they're cheaper. They don't have all the, uh, the uh, fancy electronics in them, and they're usually smaller, but not necessarily these days. Gary, I was just going to make a comment there that uh, actually I think most of the the new solid state ones, because they're using toroidal cores in them, they're usually quite a bit more compact, and the bigger ones typically use the 
great big capacitors and roller inductors and that. So they're they're usually larger and uh, and uh, they can they can be very pricey too. Yeah, I was uh, looking at different tuners for this uh, presentation. I couldn't believe that some of these are more expensive than your transceiver. So uh, $1,500, $2,000, depending how much power you're going to run. So basically, there's three types, and I don't want to get into this in any great detail, but there's what's called an L type, a Pi network type, and a T network. The L um, either has the capacitor uh, in front of the inductance, there's a series inductor, or it can be on the other side uh, towards the antenna. They're, um, they tend to be uh, used with unbalanced uh, loads, like with a coax cable. And uh, you might find that depending on which way your um, impedance is going, if you're going from a low, like 50 ohms to something lower, you would probably need the capacitor uh, on the antenna side. And if you're going from 50 ohms to higher, you should flip that around. So some of these, or most of these have a switch that allows you to flip the, uh, the capacitor in the front or in the, in the back end of this. Uh, but they're pretty compact and can be used with uh, uh, unbalanced loads pretty much uh, uh, uniquely. The Pi networks, uh, they if you look at the L, they just put a uh, capacitor both front and back. And it's shaped like the Greek letter Pi. Uh, and so, uh, but the, the, one of the, uh, the issues with, with Pi matching Pi networks is that there's more than one resonant point. So you can, uh, if you're not uh, on the best place, you can end up heating up the coil, the inductor in there, and uh, losing some energy through that. So um, they're a little more difficult to, uh, to use, but they can match just about anything. So there is an advantage to them. Uh, so if you have a random wire, uh, you can probably match it, and they'll they'll match both uh, balanced and unbalanced. We haven't really talked about that yet too much. And then the uh, T network, which is probably the most popular one, it's got a, 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 a series, two series capacitors. Uh, they're usually uh, 180 degrees phase up, um, apart and on the same uh, shaft, so that they they work together. And the nice thing about that is you get a unique solution. So once it's tuned, it's tuned, uh, you get sort of the most efficient way to do it. At least that's my understanding. So there's the three types. And of course, if you're looking online and trying to figure out which one you want, they don't tell you which kind they are. So what are the considerations, the main considerations for a tuner? Uh, how much power are you running? If you're doing QRP, you can get away with a you know something that handles five to ten watts. You don't have to worry about so much uh, uh, heat dissipation. They can be much smaller, much cheaper. Uh, size and weight. So the guys doing soda, they don't want to carry a, a big tuner with them. They don't want to carry a big anything, even antenna or rig. So it's all size and weight. Um, if you're in your trailer going out to a park somewhere, you know you don't care so much. Uh, what bands are you operating on? Uh, many of them are for 10 meters to 160 meters or 10 to 80. Some go all the way to six meters. Um, so that uh, is a design consideration and also the, the greater the uh, range, the, the greater the uh, cost. Um, the impedance matching range, how far uh, or how great a range do you need? So that should be in the specs. Uh, typically, uh, some of the better tuners will match anywhere from 6 ohms to 1600 ohms. So uh, I can't imagine a 1600 ohm antenna or even a 1000 ohms, but uh, some of these will do it. And then finally, the balanced versus unbalanced. We talked about this uh, in the course already, uh, the basic class, uh, balanced being uh, like your ladder line or twin lead. Uh, both, both uh, you can't really tell one side from the other, whereas an unbalanced uh, feed line will be your coax the, uh, or a dipole uh, is not a balanced uh, antenna, essentially. Or G5RB will be a balanced one because it's fed with, uh, with twin lead.
or ladder line. So that, that you know, some antenna uh, tuners will uh, feed just the unbalanced and some will do both. So just have a quick look at a few. This, uh, this one here, this ATU-130 uh, is fairly inexpensive. It's an automatic one. And if you look at the back of it, I, I'm just showing the back of these tu uh, tuners because the front is usually just a switch and a button. But uh, this runs off 12 volts and you put your transmit uh, coax from your transmitter into where it says TX. And you can put either a, a coax, like a, a PL259 uh, cable uh, connector on here, or this is for a single wire. So it says antenna, the ant can be this one or the red. So as long as you've got a ground on here, I don't see, I guess the black, you know, it's hard to see. This is your ground uh, connection on here. These are um, screw terminals. So this one will do both. And it's an automatic tuner. You can see how small it is. And it's 100, and, I believe 150 watt, it says, will we'll handle. This one, I think, is... Um, well, um, L LDG tuner, I believe. And this one is just unbalanced. So you put your- oh, it's, Jerry, that's fully balanced. That's the um, that's the Palstar BT-1500. It's one of the okay. only about three truly balanced uh, tuners on the market. It has a double L in it uh, okay. or a double inductor. So it has inductors in both legs and then a single capacitor across it. So. That's a really pricey tuner. That's like 15, 1700 US. Right, okay. And notice it has the BNC connector for your RF input. Yep. This is from the old Johnson mat Matchbox. It'll handle a kilowatt and it's got both as well. Your input is down here and your output is either a uh, co um, coax or a balanced line. It'll handle just about anything. So considerations, if you're getting an automatic one, there's really two kinds of automatic. One is um, automatic in the sense you press a button and it tunes to what, you're, what load it's seeing. The other one, uh, it's doubly automatic. It actually reads the, uh, the band data from your rig. So if, you're, if the, this tuner is uh, made for a specific brand, or supports a certain brand, then it automatically will set its itself um, uh, to that band. You don't even have to do anything. Um, and the considerations again: uh, how much power is required be, uh, for tunings? A lot of these require several watts, uh, five watts, ten watts to tune the antenna because it's actually measuring the power that is coming in versus the power that's going out of the antenna and trying to minimize the difference. So uh, the better tuners uh, actually use lower amounts of RF to, to do the tuning. And then there's the, the manual ones. If you're doing soda, you probably want a very rugged construction. Uh, some of them are not very rugged. So uh, I've heard stories. I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, the speed of tuning, um, if you're uh, on soda, you don't care how fast that is, but if you're doing a contest or something, you don't want to be wasting too much time tuning here and tuning there. The readability, uh, the display, you'd be surprised some of these are not very legible or easy to use. And then uh, also safety is an issue because sometimes you're going to be dealing with very high voltages inside this thing depending how much power you're running. So you wanna uh, look at possible uh, safety issues. And you can always look up on EHAM the reviews and you'll see a few of them, you know, people have uh, had some burns off of some of the tuners. Of course, they probably didn't use it right, but uh, you still, uh, we all do some silly things every now and then. So here's a few, uh, couple choices. This is the LDG. Uh, this is one of the more reasonable prices I saw, and it handles supposedly up to 125 watts, uh, 30 watts digital. So watch out if you if you have a 100% duty cycle, 
uh, CW key down, or if you're doing FT8, you don't want to be running more than 30 watts through this, this guy here. And it covers six to 160 meters. Um, and it says it's got six different cables that will interface to most modern radios. It only weighs a pound and a half, and it's 300 bucks. But it's all automatic, and you see um, uh, tune. You press the button and uh, and hope for the best. Uh, this other one I saw on uh, AliExpress, the ATU-130, I showed the back of it. And this is typically what's inside. They've got the uh, all the relay banks of relays that try a number of different uh, uh, taps on these inductors and then try to match the uh, capacitance uh, as well. So uh, it goes through a series of, uh, of trial and error until it, it comes to a, a solution. And I believe this is the T-type here. And then manual. Supposedly, um, MFJ claims that this tuner, the uh, Deluxe Versa Tuner 2, I don't know what happened to a Tuner 1, but anyway, the Tuner 2 is uh, the most popular tuner in the world, uh, which suggests that you could probably find them at uh, flea markets and whatever, <laughs> rather than pay full price. But uh, $337 at Radio World was the list price I found. I'm not selling them or recommending them, but uh, here's the back. You can actually have uh, two different uh, antennas connected uh, at the same time. The transmitter goes in the middle one, and it'll handle a, a balanced feed line as well as a single wire. The 12 volts DC is only for turning on the lamp. So if you're operating in the dark or a field day or whatever, you might want that. But otherwise, you don't really need to put any voltage in here. You're doing it manually. You're tuning the inductor and the, uh, well, it says transmitter, inductor, and antenna. It has a number of different settings on here. I haven't really looked into this too much, but uh, it's it's definitely got uh, a lot of possibilities in there. And it had a fairly good rating on the uh, EHAM. So that's, that's as far as I've gone with this. I don't want to belabor this too much. But, so what uh, about the dummy, dummy load? Is that a useful thing? What What's that for? The dummy load is actually very good. Um, this one, it has they claim it's built in. So it's a 50-ohm non-reactive load so that you can make sure that if there's a problem, your transmitter um, is not the problem. In other words, um, you're finding it really hard to match an antenna so can I match it into a, a known 50 ohm load? Because my antenna, I don't know what it is. It could be 50, it could be 500 ohm. So if, if you see that it's tuning into the dummy load, or if you have a separate dummy load with you, which would, if your antenna tuner doesn't have a dummy load, it would be good to have one on hand. So you can see, okay, my, there's nothing wrong with my rig. It's, it's the antenna. Sometimes there is something wrong with your rig, and it's uh, it's good to know that too. If it can't match a fifty ohm, a known fifty ohm load, then then uh, you got other troubles. The only other problem is that what if you're if you blow the fifty ohm dummy load in this thing, then <laughs> you've got to figure that out too. You could do that by putting too much power into it. So that's uh, a consideration as well. This one says three hundred watts max. So typically what I would say is you probably don't want to go anywhere close to 300 watts with one of these. That's a maximum thing. I would probably not go over 150 watts with one of these. Jerry, the um, MFJ has sold, uh, I don't know, about four or five versions. If you go on their website, I think they got about 30 antenna tuners, but that's why they claim it's most popular because they've sold so many of these things and uh, they do work. Um, and you do got to, you do have to watch the power. But again, what you said before, um, you may not have a unique tuning solution. So if you buy one of these tuners, be sure you read the instructions, watch a video, and uh, use the minimum inductance possible. And uh, that way you'll have uh, you'll have lower losses in the tuner. You can tune them so you burn up most of your power in the in the tuner if you're not careful. You might. Um... 
start hearing some arcing in your tuner if you get a little too much power or your antenna isn't uh, working properly you got a short or something um, and once that starts to happen uh, it may not work again properly after that unless you can go in there and clean out some of the the uh, arcing debris or whatever carbon that's in there so uh, that can happen Thanks. Oh, so, so when to use that this thing, right? Is it something that you like pre-tune? You know, like let's say if you have a digital or automatic rather tuner, is it you know you go through your band and pre-tune it and like at what increments or all you do it as needed? Like uh, how how do you know you need to tune? Okay, good question. So um, if I have uh, a rig with a tuner built in. Uh, before I turn on the tuner, I can actually, most of these have a meter, I can measure the SWR that it's seeing, and it might say 1.5, it might say 2.5 to 1. Well, okay, so let's say it says 2.5 to 1, and I don't have the tuner uh, connected, but I have a watt meter, and I see I'm only putting, it's a 100 watt rig, and I'm only putting out 70 watts or 60 watts. And I should be putting out more, but it's actually starting to shut down because it's got high SWR. Now I press the tune button in there and uh, it's much happier and it says a one-to-one -one SWR. And now I'm putting out 95 or 90 watts or more, maybe close to 100 watts. So it's actually um, got a much better match to the impedance that uh, it's seen. <sighs> Now, let's say that um, I press the tune button on it and it tells me high SWR. This little light comes on and says high SWR and I can't get a match. Well, I have two choices. I can look at my antenna and maybe improve the resonance or the, the frequency where it's resonant by adjusting the antenna itself. Let's say I have a dipole and it's too long or too short. I can try to do something about that because I know where I want to operate in that band, maybe the sideband end or the CW end. I want to uh, fix that. Or if it's where I think it should be, I can get an external tuner and go beyond what the range of my uh, rigs tuner is. A lot of the rig, the rigs have a tuner that's very limited because. Uh, the, the rig itself is is uh, has limited space, uh, so they want to keep everything into a, a certain uh, size package, so they'll use a, a fairly small tuner, and physically that, that restricts how much power and how much uh, bandwidth the tuner will handle or change in uh, impedance. So you may want an external tuner in which case you turn off the internal tuner of your transceiver and be able to feed uh, a wider variety of uh, impedances. I'll give you another example. Um, let's say you've put up a 40 meter dipole, but you want to tune it up for 30 meters because there's a lot of good DX on 30 meters at times when there's not much on 40, or you, there's a DX position that you want on 30 meters. But you know your your 40 meter dipole is not going to be resonant on 30 meters, but it's not that far off. So you might want to have an antenna tuner or an ATU to try to match your 30 meter uh, output from your rig to the 40 meter antenna. And some of them, some of the external tuners can do a pretty good job with that. So it really is for non-resident antennas um, trying to get a good match, make it look like 50 ohms to the radio. So, so on the topic of the resonant antenna, how, how do I know what my antenna is resonant on? Do I need that uh, uh, antenna analyzer for that? Or there is a... a Peter, do you want to answer that one? Uh, yeah, well, normally you know what you built your antenna for, and and uh, for example, if you have a 
a single band dipole, then it should be resonant somewhere in the band. So if you put up a 20 meter dipole, when it's installed, hopefully the antenna is good across the band. And so for HF antennas, you normally do that check when you're installing the antenna. Um, um, for VHF, that's completely different. So, um, you know, if you're talking two meters and 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 uh, you know and higher, normally those antennas are are good for almost all the band. And you check those with a watt meter, like a bird watt meter or other watt meter, and then you know you're good. You've got uh, good forward power and and low reflected power. Um, if you put up a multi-band antenna like a like a uh, G5 RV or ZS6 BKW, those antennas they're known to be not resonant really in any band at all. So what Jerry said is exactly right. Um, most people will first before they they get on the air. Um, if there's a tune function on your radio that puts out maybe 10 watts, that's great. If not, what you would do is you would go to CW or FM or RTTY and put a very small amount of power, like 10 watts, and then check the SWR, uh, as Jerry said. Um, yeah, and yes, what you said is right, that if you really wanted to see how your antenna normally is doing, uh, it's great to run an antenna analyzer across the band and check out your antennas on all bands and all frequencies and uh, and actually write it down or make a note of it or make a picture of it. And then, you know, if it's changed in the, in the future. So you'll have an idea then if your antenna has really done something weird with, you know, with the weather or something like that. Uh, does that answer the question, Rob? Um, yeah, I, I suppose, you know, I, I don't build antennas, right? I just, you know, picked it up. I, I got a, uh, 40, 20, 10 and six, uh, dipole, right? But like, that's so what the, the Alpha the, Deltas? Um, no, something called the Buckmaster. Okay. Um, and well, the, they, they tell me that this is supposed to be resident, right? But I don't know, like, is, is it important to uh, the frequency, right? Because uh, there's all that uh, band plan, right? Like I want my SSB, I guess, to, I want it to be resident on the SSB that, that I'm using it on, right? Not, not on CW yeah. or so. Well, one of those, one of the things that they assume when they design those antennas, commercial antennas, is that it's at a, a, a reasonable height above ground and that you've got a decent ground and whatever. So, but the problem is with, when you put up a, an antenna like that, uh, it will vary uh, its resonant uh, frequency on each band a little bit based on where, it, you know, how high it is and what your ground is and what it's near, if it's near uh, metal objects and so on. So the, the thing that you can do, um, you can use a uh, SWR analyzer. Uh, they don't have to be complicated. You can use like an MFJ 259, which is what I have. It's an old one. It just tells you uh, SWR and, and uh, resistance, or you can use a fancy uh, a VNA or a whole bunch of other things. The nice thing about these, um, there's there's uh, more sophisticated ones that actually will scan. They will start. They will put a signal out. Let's say you're on 40 meters, and they will cover. You you can tell it start at uh, just below the band, 6.9 megahertz, and and scan all the way to 7.5 megahertz, and you'll cover the full band, and then it'll show a graphical display, and you'll see a line that and all of a sudden a dip. And then it'll come back up, and I'm out of the camera. But anyway, uh, so you'll you'll see a, a, a profile, and you'll see where that dip is, and how steep that dip is for uh, SWR, and where the dip on that profile is is the resonant frequency, and then you can see okay where uh, where is how wide is that dip for a two to one SWR? And you can get a range of frequencies from 7.1 to 7.2, for example. So th that would tell you on your rig, I can operate uh, better than two to one SWR between 7.1 and 7.2. Is that where I wanna be? Well, maybe not. So then you have to figure out, maybe I need to uh, add or subtract a little length on there, but 
typically um, they should be close enough that the tuner within your radio, your transceiver should be able to handle that uh, if they're designed for those bands. But you don't know until you actually, uh, I mean, you could do it manually. You could, uh, a lot of people do this. I've done it for years. You actually go to 7.01 and you, uh, put out 10 watts, as Peter was saying, and you note the SWR from your meter on the radio, write it down, and then you go up a little bit in frequency and do it again and write down that SWR, and you can go right across the band and you'll you'll see how it, it changes as you... And that's sort of a, sort of a kind of a antenna analyzer, right? Like uh, just doing it manually, right? Yes, yeah. you're, you're doing the analysis right. yourself. Yeah, you can yeah, then okay. put it into a spreadsheet and graph it up and see where it goes. Uh, Rob, um, um, what kind of a radio do you have, Rob? I got a Yesu FT991A. And okay. I finally got, yeah, it has a it has a tuner, but I keep forgetting to tune. Yeah, it, it, it seemed to be working without it. I, I, I don't know, like just yeah. today I, I, I talked to Costa Rica, but maybe just a beginner's luck, you know? I. Uh, that was my furthest uh, uh, contact so far. Um, uh, um, Rob, I, I, uh, the, the, I think the unwritten rule of uh, working on HF is always look at your SWR, you know, um, just a little bit, just a test whistle or whatever. And uh, you look at your SWR meter, if it's less than two to one, you're good to go. And, and then you don't have any worries. So no, you don't need to worry about a tuner um, uh, at all, as long as you see that SWR is low and then you have the confidence that uh, nothing is, uh, you know, nothing is going wrong. Um, I really like uh, a power meter in the line at all times. I think it's the very first station accessory. Um, and uh, I have an MFJ993 uh, automatic tuner, which I had in line for years and years and never used the tuner very rarely, but it's got a really beautiful bar graph meter that shows your power coming out and another one that shows the SWR. And so you know that everything is good and nothing's burning up, you know, and uh, I think that's, that's important. Uh, um, one last comment, the Buckmaster is an off-center fed dipole. Um, and this is not, um, like it's not a specific one band resonant antenna. So you have to be a little careful with that. Um, and also watch that you don't have any weird effects in the ham shack. You can get RF in the shack from those. So if you don't have it, don't worry about it. But uh, if you do, uh, you know, if you see something weird, then come back, ask us some more questions and. We can give you some some ideas on that, Rob. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, you know, I tried tuning, but I did not see any difference, to be honest. Like my my no. uh, issue was not really tuning, you know, it was a noise. I am st still combating it, you know. Like I, uh... yeah. yeah. Jerry, can I just share a screenshot? Um, we're talking about um, sweeping an antenna across a band. I've got a I've got a chart to show. So this is a friend of mine that has a, a multi-band hex beam, right? And he wanted to see how well tuned it was because, you know, when you assemble it, they tell you, you know, measure this element this long, et cetera, et cetera. But he wanted to make sure that he did a good job. But what I'm showing here is the gray part of the scan. This is on a, uh, a nano VNA scan, by the way. But the gray section is the actual handband, in this case, the 10 meter handband. But you see how I go a little bit below and a little bit above. The idea being that, like here's six meters, for example. So you can see, you know, it gets worse outside the band, but as you get to the bottom of the band, it gets better. Seeing that trend, not just looking at the band itself from, you know, top to bottom of the band, but look outside of it as well. And uh, trying to find one. So here's an example. So on 20 meters, you know, you look at that and you go, oh yeah, you know, um, on 14, 200, you know, it doesn't look bad. It's 1.35 or whatever. But in the grand scheme of things, look at where the dip is. It's way below the band at 13.9 or something. So this would indicate that 
um, adjustment of the antenna is necessary, right? To bring the the lowest spot, which is the resonance spot, somewhere into the middle of the band. So, so, so the tuner would not do that? It would the, not- The tuner will. Well. Oh yeah, a, a tuner absolutely will do that. But let's say, for example, you know, you want to build a dipole, you know, a 20 meter dipole. And the idea of having a resonant antenna is that you don't need a tuner, mm. right? So, you know, if you only want to operate on one band, um, Jerry Cruel that lives up here in the north end of Okotoks had a 20 meter monoband Yagi, right? So, you know, it shouldn't need a tuner when he's on 20 meters, but you want to make sure that you have it tuned. So if this was a 20 meter dipole, for example, you would list, look at this and go, yeah, it's too low outside of the band. So you would adjust the lengths of your elements to bring this low spot, like this 1.2 or whatever to one into somewhere inside the band. Yeah, that's exactly now where I started. I wanted to get a, an MFJ dipole and then I read the manual and it's like, you know, you gotta make it resonant and make yeah. it shorter or longer. Like how the hell do I do that, right? Like I, I'm just starting out. So that's how I ended up with Buckmaster that uh, don't tell you the gory details. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And some of these multi-band antennas must have a tuner. You know, you take a G5RV as an example, right? It's got to have a tuner. You can't use it. It's, it is actually somewhat resonant near 20 meters, but not dead on in the band. So, you know, some antennas, you have to have a tuner. But if you're trying to adjust, you know, a fan dipole or, you know, a dipole, uh, sweep outside of just the handband you know if you just looked in the gray box and and that's all that you were looking at you wouldn't see where your your actual point of resonance is outside the band and you can fix that and bring it into the band so always look wider whether you yeah. use a manual analyzer um of course you can't do that with your radio because you don't want to be transmitting out of band so, you know, doing it with radio is not a good idea. In fact, some radios don't even allow you to go out of band. Uh, so this is where an antenna analyzer is good. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a number of them out there. And um, that's what you want to try and achieve. So, Dan, if I could just ask you to clarify something. I think Rob asked a question about whether this will tune your antenna. And you said yes. But my thought is... The antenna. Oh, sorry, I, I understood if a tuner will tune that antenna. Right. So the two sorry. different things that are in my mind, I want to make sure Rob's clear on this, is that when you uh, run an antenna analyzer, and in this case, you've got a, a nano VNA that you're looking at the sweep and you're seeing a really definite dip there. That's the optimum frequency for that antenna. And you want to tune the antenna by physically changing its length so that you're moving that dip into the band, into the amateur band. Yeah. That is improving the antenna. That's making the antenna work better. It's going to transmit further. It's going to receive weaker signals. It's a better antenna. The ante antenna tuner that Jerry's talking about is not doing that job. It's instead making the receiver happy with the numbers and it has the lower SWR from the antenna, but this graph that you're showing is what the antenna is actually doing, and you want to optimize the antenna first before you, um, I mean, it's obvious that this antenna here needs to be optimized in order to work correctly in the amateur band, right? So, so then the tuner will not move that uh, dip in the it, graph to the right? It doesn't the move the dip. The tuner fakes it out for your radio uh, okay. to think that the impedance is going to be, mm. um, you know, correct, is going to be 50 ohms at whatever frequency you're, you're set to, mm. right? But That's it doesn't right. change the antenna. It makes your radio think that it's 50 ohms because, you know, if you're at the top end of the band over here 
and this looks like you know 1.6 to 1 or whatever right that's not 50 ohms what's do i can't do the math in my head you know that might be say you know 65 ohms so what it does is the tuner presents 50 ohms to your radio despite the antenna being 65 ohms your radio is happy your radio puts out full power but the efficiency of the antenna is still off okay right? yeah. yeah so can, 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 can i, I make say, a, that's a, where a I comment get the idea that Antenna tuner is not a really great name for an antenna matching device, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an antenna matching unit. You know, it's a device that makes your radio think you have a per perfect antenna. Um, can I can I kind of direct at Rob's original uh, comment? And I think it's absolutely great, and it's something that um, that we think we should amplify more in the in the basic classes, Jerry. Um, does it matter really is what Rob's saying that does it really matter and um, you know if if you have put an antenna up uh, the reality of HF antennas Rob is that you said the MFJ dipole requires tuning whatever and they give you the instructions they're just being honest because um, I can tell you that very few HF antennas you put up are not uh, near something in the environment. And so they will need, um, you know, some retuning, sometimes severely so. Uh, I talked to a fellow who just put up a vertical antenna and they couldn't get it to work on 40 meters. It was about 10 feet from a house that had stucco wire on the siding. So they had to actually modify the antenna to get it to work. Um, but um, going back to what you said, if you put up an antenna and you check the SWR and it's it's a two to one or two point five to one, um, and uh, and then you go and use an antenna tuner, as Dan says, to make the radio to make the radio happy, you're just fine. It's no sweat at all unless you're running a thousand watts. Um, uh, and and if if you want, then as you learn more about this this stuff, then you can get uh, an analyzer or you could figure out how to retune your antenna. So if it's working and you don't have a high SWR, if it's under two or two and a half to one, don't worry about it. You're just fine on the lower bands. Um, you're not going to lose much. So uh, it, it's 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 really just a fine point uh, for beginning ham. I wouldn't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the best antenna you can get is the one that you plug into the antenna jack of your radio, right? Yeah. So even if it's not perfect, um, you know, even a built-in tuner, they typically have a range of up to three to one. They're pretty narrow range where some of the third party, you know, like LDGs will say, oh, we can tune 3000 to one, whatever, right? But, um, uh, you know, it depends how close your antenna is. Like, you know, this guy here, um, so Steve's antenna, right? When he kicks in the auto tuner on his transceiver, um, it brings, you know, if he's up at the top end of this band, it'll bring it down to one-to-one, -to -one just like, boom, that quick, right? So his radio, his transceiver is happy <clears throat> and the antenna is good enough. And, you know, he talks to people all over the place. He's a big sideband guy. Plus he runs this on a, uh, uh, on a flex. <clears throat> and, you know, he's got a hell of a fun time with his radio, even okay. though his antenna is not perfect. All right. I, I'd like to uh, ask Gord, the success fees made a comment to me on the chat to uh, step in. He's uh, wants to make a good point here. I think that, uh, might help a few people as well. Uh, Gord. Yeah, you, you started the conversation and, and you went into the correct points and you went out of the correct points and you went out and in and out. And what I want to do is just try to simplify this and recap this thing here a little bit. Uh, first of all, antenna tuners is a misnomer. The industry has got that wrong. Antennas have Antennas have a resonance. Antennas have a speed point impedance. When an antenna is at resonance, depending upon the antenna, speed point impedance gets close to 50 ohms. What these antenna tuners 
all they're doing is making sure that you get maximum transfer of power between the transmitter and what you're feeding it into the feed point of the antenna. That's it. It does not tune the antenna. So if you can and if you can nail down basically or hardwire in your brain that there's antenna resonance, that's a separate discussion. And from antenna resonance, depending upon the configuration of the antenna, that will give you its feed point impedance. The feed point impedance changes as you move around the frequency because resonance is frequency dependent. So again, uh, antenna tuners, all they're doing is applying the specific type of impedance as inductive reactance and has capacitive reactance. And we play with that to try to make the transfer of power impedance or one-to-one -one purely resistant. That's when you get maximum transfer power. So everything else, you, you, you know, the, the, you've got to, if you want to talk about antennas, and fixing antennas and making antennas resonant, so you get maximum radiation efficiency, that's in a separate box. It's a separate activity. If you want to uh, make sure that your transmitter, I don't care anybody's transmitter, they're all 50 ohm. If they, you, want, you want to couple that energy into a 50 ohm load. And that's what we call these antenna tuners do. So you, you guys, great discussion. You're getting close, okay? But, but, you're, but you're, they're, you're, you're, the terms are being mixed around. And if you want to get clarity to tack all of these problems, you, you've got to put them in their separate boxes and work within that box. The minute you start confusing between the two boxes, you're going to end up chasing your tail. I hope I've made a little sense there. Okay, Gord, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, there, there are two different things, uh, just to recap the recap, and that is uh, you want to have a resonant antenna for where you want to operate as close as you can to the frequency or frequencies that you want to operate. So if you're on 20 meters and you want to do CW, you want it to be resonant at the bottom end of the band or sideband towards the top end of the band and so on. It's like that. For yeah, and, you're right. And, and, and as you, you'll find out that if you put a 10 meter antenna, 10 meter dipole, it has a natural bandwidth that stays at say we think 1.5 to one, okay? Yeah, uh, that bandwidth, you, you go to 15 meters, you just use the same wire, you put it up the kind of the same, let's say 20 feet, you'll find that bandwidth will decrease. You go to 40 meters, that bandwidth will decrease. You go to 40 meters, that bandwidth will decrease right down to you get down 160 meters and the one to five one that, the bandwidth is like 20 kilohertz. <laughs> and that then that's a discussion we talk about cues of antennas based upon frequency. So Again, people use antenna tuners. You built a, a dipole for, for 40 meters, like you mentioned. Because of the Q of, the, of, a, of a dipole, that you're going to get a one point of only about around 100 kilohertz, maybe 150. Covers the CW portion of the van. You go to sideband, 7.2 7 to 7.3. SWR goes high, and because it's a little, it's a little different, the Q of, of the antenna. And that's another discussion. But anyways, the thing to remember that the antenna tuner, all it does is change that impedance that the transmitter says, so you can end up delivering power. Does it change the resonance of the antenna? No. Does it change the radiation efficiency, efficiency of the antenna? No. You have to use other means to address that. Okay. And, and this is, of course, Gord, assuming that you're talking about uh, an antenna tuner, antenna matching unit at the radial, not at the base of the antenna. Well, yeah, that's another discussion. Okay, that's another discussion, right? Uh, that, that's another process, that's another procedure, that's another way of, of handling something, you bet. But I think the most of the conversation was based radio, built-in radio antenna tuner, and then of course you've got an outside antenna tuner. If you do a quick right. research, you go through all the ICOM specs, the ASU cups, the Kenwood specs. Most yeah. of the antenna tuners will handle between basically roughly about 16 ohms to about 150 ohms as a playing with feed point impedance. Pretty narrow, like Jerry mentioned, small components, things like that. 
You got an yeah. outside antenna tuner, got a bigger range. Most of the bigger antenna range you got from six ohms to high to a high of fifteen hundred to two thousand ohms. So again, that's it, that's a function of of components and variable levels of that. Yeah, well, one thing that uh, Jerry didn't uh, didn't mention is the remote antenna tuners, which are very popular now. So, uh, especially with things like the forty three foot vertical and all that. So, uh, like you say, that's a that's a different uh, different category here. Absolutely, that's right. If you know, if you uh, antenna efficiency, antenna resonance, antenna feed point, transmission feed point, transmitter feed point, are all separate boxes. And they all have to be handled it differently. Jerry, can I show this picture of the um, of the MFJ nine nine three? Sure, go ahead. Um, this um, I just uh, Rob might be interested in this um, that I really suggest that you have something in line. And if you look at that little green display on the MFJ. Um, while you're transmitting, it reads out the frequency, it reads out the forward and reflected power, and it reads out the SWR. And um, I know uh, Nero mentioned she has an IT100, and I have one of those as well. Um, but uh, for a shack accessory, uh, this gets as close as you can get to something like, uh, uh, you know, to a very fancy power meter. So I just think it's uh, an absolutely great shack accessory. And when you're transmitting, you know what's happening all the time. If you should need um, uh, a, the need the tuning function, it's there for you. So uh, I really recommend you have an inline uh, watt meter, power meter of some sort, either analog like this guy or digital or both there. So back to you, Jerry. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, uh, Gord and Peter and everyone for, for this uh, good discussion. I wanted to add one more thing that I think might give you uh, some clarity. Um, and that is, and I think uh, Pat actually hit on this pretty well earlier. And that is, if, you, uh, if you're listening on your radio uh, on 40 meters, let's say, and you've got your 40 meter antenna selected. Um, it's resonant <laughs> close to where you're listening. You'll hear a lot of noise, even if there's no signal there. You'll hear a pretty good uh, background noise because it's resonant and it's picking up all kinds of uh, things that are hitting it at that wavelength or that, that the, the frequency you're listening on. If you switch to a different antenna, let's say you put your uh, 20 meter dipole on but you're still listening to 40 meters, you'll suddenly hear a lot lower noise level. That's because it's not resonant where your radio is trying to listen. And so um, think about what a tuner would do if you're trying to transmit on 40 meters into a 20 meter antenna. It's gonna have a hard time. It's gonna, your tuner is gonna try to match it as best it can and it's gonna have a hard time doing it. The more expensive tuners will probably be able to put some signal out. But think about what you're, you'd be hearing. It would be very inefficient, both receiving and transmitting. And so the antenna tuner is not really uh, appropriate, let's say, for that, that uh, situation to tune a, uh, a, the wrong band antenna for the band you want. And you won't be hearing much either. So it's very inefficient. So it doesn't change uh, the tuning on your 20 meter dipole to match 40 meters. It's just making it, uh, making the transmitter a little happier and putting some power out into it. So that's kind of a, a more a visual, uh, I think at least I'm visualizing that because I, I can tell right away if I'm on the right antenna by hearing the right amount of noise. Uh, it's resonant for the band that I'm, I'm wanting to listen on. And if I don't hear that noise, I'm probably on the wrong, I haven't thrown the switch in the right position or whatever. Um, another thing that um, I wanted to, to raise is um, this concept, a visual concept of impedance matching. And uh, this was an experiment I did many years ago in, in a physics lab in university. We had uh, two different springs um, a very wide coil, um, sort of rigid one, and then a very narrow diameter springy one. And we tried to hook them both together. And if you 
uh, snapped the, the long, uh, very elastic springy one and it hit the the other one, the the stiff wide diameter one, it would, you would see a reflection coming back right away. Well, that's an impedance mismatch. And what we ended up doing was someone had built this, uh, this spring that went from one diameter to the other. And uh, so it actually changed its diameter in a linear way over a certain distance. So you're actually matching one impedance to the other and you snap the, the, the very uh, flexible spring. And you saw in the middle section with this uh, spring that actually changed its diameter, it got larger to the other one. You actually saw it, it uh, able to move that energy through to the other one. So that's kind of what an antenna tuner is doing electronically. It's matching one impedance to another to get most signal through. And that's what it's actually, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's actually measuring the power out minus the power in and minimizing the difference. So that's, that's kind of the summary I have. I see that a lot of people are making comments that they have antenna tuners. I hope that, uh, uh, it seems like some people are, have, have had a learning experience with it. It hasn't been all that much fun, or it's been uh, uh, a little more than they bargained for. So I wonder if uh, we might bring in somebody who's been playing with one. I know like Nero says she's got one. Uh, if you want to make a few comments uh, on, on how you went about understanding what it's doing. Uh, brute force and ignorance. <laughs> I just uh, uh, sat down with the manual and uh, uh, worked my way through it. So the tuner that I bought, um, the uh, LDG AT100, this one, I bought it to match or to go with the um, Kenwood TS430. Mm -hmm. Um, because I just put an attic dipole in and I didn't know if uh, it was going to be resonant for 20 and 40 meters um, with the radio. So I bought that tuner and um, once I figured it out, it took me a while to figure out how to make it work, but it, it worked really well I once I understood what it was doing. Um, and since I got the 7300, I'm afraid I've just sort of let the radio do everything for me. Um, so I got a bit lazy, but um, the uh, uh, LDG seemed to work uh, quite well when it was put with the um, Kenwood radio. So you're finding that the 7300 handles the range of SWR that, that you need? Yeah, I've just got the four band um, uh, 10, 15, 20, and 40, and I, I'm... I don't always check the SWR, um, but when when I do see it or when I'm watching it, monitoring it, it's um, I can't remember which band it's on. It's a, it's as high as two point five, which is which is high. It probably shouldn't be there, but um, it's still not too bad. It's still not too bad. Yeah. Thank is that you. after matching, Nero? Is that after you try to match? Uh, that's five? just with the. That's just with the onboard uh, tuner on the radio. Okay, so, so that's the radio after le any, letting it do its thing. The radio won't do any better than two and a half, then. Or I don't, I don't know how to make it do any better. I, I, I just ran through the tuning cycle. Maybe I'm missing something. No, if you're, that's okay. If you ran through the tuning cycle and it's still two and a half, I think you did the best you can. I think those tuners can match up to about three to one. But the same as my my Kenwood. The uh, I, I, the, the ICON seventy three hundred is uh, a three to one uh, mm -hmm. is the max, and I have a I I bought fan dipoles the DX EEs, and I've got two of them. They're ninety degrees apart, and I found <clears throat> that I couldn't using the tuner on the ICOM. I couldn't. I just, I didn't trim the antenna. I just took it as it came and put it up. I wasn't able to get all, like it's good for 10, 15, uh, 40 and 20. And I wasn't able to use all parts. The icon could not match less than three to one on all parts of the band. So I went to a, 
a mat uh, 180H uh, external. And now I match, it, it gives me the capability of all the, uh, all the band, as well as I can do 12 meters and 17 meters. I've got a 7300 as well. And what I have noticed on occasion is that uh, if I run the tuning cycle twice, the SWR gets better than it does the first time. Peter, you're muted. There are many tuners where um, that is what you do. I think the MFJ is one of those that uh, a second choice at the tuning cycle, but gives you uh, another try at the tuning. It goes into a more in-depth al algorithm because really what it is, it's a kind of a thing that goes in steps and it wants to get there as fast as it can. Uh, and then uh, it, it kind of memorizes where it was and then it'll use finer steps on that second tuning try. I noticed uh, Amir had a comment earlier about uh, his MFJ Versa tuner. Did you want to add something to that? I'll just show you a green share here. So that is the uh, chart I made up for mine. Uh, I use an off-center fed uh, 10 to 40. And literally, if I know, okay, I want to go to 20 meters, I, I just quickly set on my all my dials. And I am coming in at 1.12 at the highest uh on on anything here um they're they're just great little tuners i love the manual tuner i have a yesu dx 3000 with the internal tuner in it and um it's it's close but um with the off center fed like peter said i do get a little bit of rf coming back nothing with the versa tuner or um the the portable right i've, I've used this one too uh in the truck uh, with whatever radio I happen to have in there, the little travel tuner, and that's the 90, uh, MFJ 902. Um, so there, there are very distinct advantages to, uh, manually operated versus automatic. Um, but, um, automatic or, or quick. So if you're in a hurry and you're contesting, uh, I can see a big advantage to, if you're going to jump bands, press a button and go, <laughs> but, uh, I really like it. Uh, I got this one at a um, uh, at uh, a Kara. It was a a member sale. Someone who was clearing out their shack. And I think I paid one hundred and fifty dollars for it, and I just love the cross needle uh, uh, forward and reflected, so you can really see what's happening uh, as you're moving along. And one thing I found with this little off center fed uh, antenna is as the temperature changes in the morning and the evening, um, I know that the the thing must be contracting and expanding ever so slightly because I can watch the SWR climb and, and shrink and I can go in and just tweak it for uh, my, my new antenna length. And it must, you know, over whatever the 80 feet or whatever it is, I'm sure there's a quarter inch or a half inch of uh, contraction and expansion because it's a, um, a copper coated steel uh, wire. So there's gotta be a little bit of um, adjusting that has to be done. and. When I switch from digital to um, uh, phone, um, it's nice to be able to just hand tweak it as you're going along. So, anyone sure. notice a change in their SWR with the snow cover on the ground? Uh, not on the ground, but on the wire. <laughs> I usually go outside and uh, shake everything before uh, make sure there's no snow on it. But I just know the temperature does seem to make a bit of a difference. And maybe that's just the, uh, my, my PL259 connectors. Uh, there could be a little bit of moisture in there for when I put them in. Uh, I try and keep them all super dry and clean when they're assembled and then um, keep them uh, coated with uh, coax seal, keep all the moisture out so everything drains one direction off. But you know, stuff happens, it's Calgary. I haven't really noticed too much of a change in SWR with, with temperature, but uh, definitely if there's rain or, or moisture, I can, I can sense that at times. Um, I do too. Okay. Especially Harry, with the ground um, mounted vertical. One of the questions on the uh, chat there was a recommendation for power meters. 
And, um, you know, there might be some discussion there. I just wanted to throw in um, the ultimate power meter. Actually, there's one other brand on the market Jerry might remember. Um, this one is uh, a kit. Not anymore. I don't think he sells the kit anymore. You have to buy it built. Yeah, you have to buy it built. And um, this is uh, a picture of it. Um, okay, sure. Here we go. Um, here's a picture of the LP100. And uh, unfortunately, the prices have gone up. I don't know what I paid, $250 or something. And they're extremely pricey now. But these they're have an external power now. sensor and can go down into milliwatts. Uh, up to a kilowatt. You can even get external or uh, multiple power sensors. So if you ever wanted the ultimate power meter accessory, these even are uh, more accurate than a bird watt meter, believe it or not. They have a better, uh, they have a better calibration uh, uh, link to NIST. So um, there you go. If anybody wants the ultimate Christmas present for your, your shack, there you go. That's, yeah, that's what Along I those lines, there's a wave node which is very similar. Yes. Um, and the wave node has a USB interface that, and then there's some software you can run on your PC. So you so can actually it. have a little display, you know, on the side of your screen beside your, you know, whatever your uh, digital modes or whatever that you're running, right? And you can have an indication of uh, real time when you transmit. So look at the wave node. They're not cheap. They run in the, almost 400 US dollars. But similar thing with a, uh, with a remote sensor. And the newest model, you can have up to four sensors. So like a friend of mine, for example, has two sensors, one um, before his amplifier, like between the transmitter and the amp. And then, um, sorry, I gotta run. Um, and then he's got one after the uh, amplifier as well. Yeah, um, I have the LP100A and it's also uh, got a USB connection. You can run some software and look at things, but uh, it's it's really overkill for the, the beginner. Um, you don't need anything that, that uh, com complex or fancy, but eventually you might want to think about it. The, um, the, the other thing is, um, you know, we really don't want to recommend a particular brand or or uh, model because there, there are so many out there and we want you to kind of think about what it is you're actually, what, what you actually need. The other way of doing this is to look on, on the swap uh, meets and, and the flea markets, see what's available, and then go to eHAM usually as, as a good source, eHAM.net. And they have a review of just about everything you could ever think of uh, uh, related to ham radio equipment and see what the, the comments are. Uh, some people are, are way out of line on them, uh, but in general, they're pretty good. And they give you a, a four or five star rating, I think, on these things. So um, if you can find a SWR meter or power meter, uh, for a reasonable price, you might even find one for $50 or $100 um, that's in good condition, whatever. Uh, check it out on eHAM. Uh, chances are that that'll do what you need. So I don't think you have to go way overkill on some of these, but if you're into designing antennas and, and uh, want every last bit of efficiency out of it, then you can go with, with uh, the high-end stuff. But that would be my recommendation. So how do you hook all these things together uh, with patch cables? Like what, what is a, a patch cable? I've been getting three foot long RG213s right. to hook things together with, but they're pretty inflexible. Is that the right thing to do? Well, in the shack, um, because you've got very short distances between these things, you don't need really the RG213. You can get away with the RG58, the thinner stuff, or RG8X. Uh, it's 50 ohm, and it's a lot more flexible, and you're not going to have hardly any loss there anyway. I think you get, there's a bit of loss for each time you have a connector on the line as well. 
but uh, for HF, I wouldn't worry about that kind of loss. Uh, it gets more, uh, you know, uh, severe with high frequencies as you're up at new HF frequencies. But for HF, I would recommend just the whatever uh, 58 or 8X or whatever for your, your patch cables. And uh, it's always better to have a shorter length than a longer length because uh, the longer it is, the more it's tends to coil up and then uh, you can get inductive coupling to something else so or pick up noise. So uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Any other comments on that? So some of the small LMR cables, like LMR 195 kind of thing, right? Which has got full shielding as opposed to RG58, which is only, you know, like you can see light through, you can read a book through the shield if you were to strip it off. Um, so uh, again, like Jerry says, it's not about the loss over, you know, three feet, six feet, whatever your jumper is, but it's a, it's probably best to go with a better shielding, which is why when you said 213, I, I said thumbs up, right? Because it's, uh, it's very well shielded. So that's something to keep in mind, but thinner diameter and flexible, like, uh, like the LMR series, or um, you can get like clones of it stuff. Um, and in terms of connector losses, Jim Heath, W6LG, uh, did a YouTube where, you know, he kind of dispels the myth about, you know, people that lose their mind over how many connectors you have and adapters and couplers and, you know, gender changers and all that kind of stuff and how much loss you're introducing, right? So look for one of his YouTube videos that he did and it'll put your mind at ease. You're not going to worry about how many connectors you've got uh, in line. That's for HF. I, I've, HF. Uh, Dan, I've never had any issues with RG58 at HF. Of course, don't use it at UHF but or VHF. But, uh, you know, other than connectors or badly put on connectors, I've never had any issues at all there. And uh, I don't worry about it in the least. As a matter of fact, for an antenna switch right now, and uh, it's one of these uh, temporary permanent things, it's an old CB antenna switch. And, uh, you know, I've got 100 watts through it, and that's no issue at all. So, um, you know, yeah, it doesn't it's matter. It's pretty forgiving at HF, whereas at higher frequencies, you get into UHF and stuff, you're right. Then every little bit helps. Every fraction of a dB loss, of course, is significant. But yeah, at HF, it's more about, like I said, I, I look at those jumpers on HF more as the shielding when I'm running two radios, right, at the same time, you know, into two different antennas, both sides of the yard. So if I go into transmit on one radio and I've got the other radio on the desk beside it and the feed line all goes up one big bundle to go out of my shack, right? Their shielding makes a difference when you've got, you know, adjacent cables and stuff. And it might be the last few dB when you're really trying to get rid of noise, because that was another topic that, uh, you know, might be a future thought, Jerry, for, um, you know, just what is noise? Uh, where does it come from um, at a simple level? I mean, you know, what, you know, you know, you turn on your radio and like the other night it was on 80 meters and I thought my, my antenna was really getting quiet, but it turns out it was all atmospheric and, and people who are well, uh, well experienced that stuff every once in a while you crash, scratch your head. So uh, Dan made me think about it because that's where better shielding on a cable and your RF chokes and all that can, can give you a quieter feed line than a shack. So. Okay, very good. Uh, have we beaten this topic to death? Uh, <laughs> any last comments before we uh, we move on? The uh, I had lots of questions, but it's hard to get in to this uh, conversation. Um, the, you mentioned that nine nine three nine MFJ thing. The one I bought is a 939. It was specifically for a Yezu. It had to have the letter Y at the end. When I look at this 99391, one, it doesn't say anything about what radio it's good for. It lists a bunch of radios specifically, but it doesn't list necessarily the FT991 I have. So is there an actual 
are they designed for specific radios, I guess, is what I'm wondering, like uh, the 939 was. Can I answer that? Anybody can answer it. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. So when there's a particular you know model made for a radio, it's usually because there's an interface available that connects to uh, like a data port on your radio, whether it's used for band switching or, you know, one of the earlier pictures of a tuner that we saw with a tune button, right? So if it talks, quote unquote, talks to a particular model of radio, right? Then when you push and hold the tune button, right? What it does is it commands your radio to say drop to five watts and go into transmit, okay? And so it sends the right signals or commands to that make and model and brand of radio. But that's the only reason. A, a generic tuner will work, like any tuner will work for any radio. It's just that convenience interface on, you know, like say the, uh, the LDG, you know, the one meant for Yesu has that interface and sends commands to your radio. That's the only difference. And if you plug it into a Kenwood, of course, the commands are different, right? So how does so, it work then? How would it possibly work then? So you, you they it would work with any radio. But they also have cool. like a sort of generic mode, right? Where if they, where, for example, it's still an auto tuner, but that push button tune probably won't do anything. However, when you put the radio uh, into CW and you key down on whatever frequency you're going to transmit on, right, then the auto tuner will kick in, right, and you'll hear the relays chatter while it finds a tuning solution and then tune anyway. It's just the convenience of having that tune button on the front of the tuner that tells your radio, you know, to transmit and so on and so forth. That's the only difference. My LDG, I've got, you know, a six inch cable that goes to my Yesu radio. That's exactly what it does. I can run it without the cable, but then if I push and hold the tune button, it doesn't do anything. I have to be transmitting, right? Justin, Justin made a very valid point. And this is, I think one of the most poorly um, mentioned things in all of ham radio, especially for a new a newbie when you're trying to get going with tuning, is a lot of radios have a tune button on them. And the whole idea is you want to put out a little bit of RF before you get and start transmitting, before you even put out that QRL to see if your radio is working. You want to check that forward reverse power and you want to check the SWR. And I have, I don't know, I've got an IC7000. I had a Kenwood. I've got a Yesu, and all of these may have a tune button, but the tune button doesn't work. It doesn't do anything unless you buy this particular interface to a tuner, uh, whatever the heck. And and that's a real it's a real it's a real pain. And so what Dan said is correct that if you buy a tuner that has the interface, for example, an IC7000, which is an older radio, will go to the IT100 tuner. You press the tune button on that, and now the, the, um, the radio will recognize the tuner and the tune button on the radio works. Otherwise, you have to go through the following procedure, as we mentioned. First of all, you have to change your mode out of SSB or whatever you had, go to RTTY, turn your power down to 10 watts, then you have to um, press the push to talk button on there to check whatever's happening and do whatever tuning you want to do. Then you've got to go back and turn your power back up to 100 watts, change your mode back over to SSB, and you got to do that every time you use your tuner. And that's true for all manual tuners and for all the tuners that Justin was talking about that don't have the interface. So, um, you know, that's something that really you want to research before you, you spend money on a tuner. And uh, for me, uh, I had on my uh, my Yesu radio, the FT-1000, 
what I ended up finding out is that if I bought the external keypad for that radio, it had a real tune button on it. And that tune button, you simply hold a button down and it sends out a 10 watt carrier. Now, why radio manufacturers don't do that? I think that's the biggest pain in the neck I've ever heard of. And um, I own a, an IC705, uh, as, as, as uh, uh, Claude was mentioning, and the IC705 doesn't have it either, but they do have a super thing in there. And they have a, a panel selectable SWR function. So if you select that SWR and then you push one of the, it's all touch screen, and then you push another little button, then you go click, 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 click with a microphone and it measures the SWR all across the band. So the IC705 does have a, a more or less tuned function on it. But in any case, that's a rant of mine that uh, I, uh, to, to get a radio that doesn't have a tune function, I think it's a pain in the neck. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure Nero, you've used the uh, IC7300 and uh, I'm pretty sure it has that, uh, that SWR function as well. So that's your route to using a tuner that doesn't have an interface. I, I, I hope that, uh, that, that, that answered uh, Justin's question, I don't know. <laughs> Justin, if I can answer to your 991, um, <clears throat> specifically right there on the bottom left-hand side, let's see, did I share it right? Uh, bottom left, right below your antenna port, you'll yeah. see tuner line in, it's a mini DIN, I think it's a eight pin. Yeah. When you order an automatic tuner, MFJ, LDG, whatever. Yeah, it's plugged it. in. I have it. Yeah. Yeah. I I was having like nothing was happening. Like I was getting nothing. Yeah. My so, SWR was eight, and I couldn't hear anything on any of the bands because I don't know what an RTTY or SSB is. Whatever you just said, Peter, is I don't even have that written down, so it doesn't matter. It's already gone. So, um, so in your um, yeah. 991A menu, you need to go I, in and tell it you have an external tuner and then tell it to use 10 watts or 20 watts, whatever you like. That's probably the thing I'll take away from this is Jerry's first sentence is that I had to turn off the internal tuner. Although, to be fair, I tried it with both it on and off because I had no idea. So, I don't know if my problem was with the antenna, whether my stick was it's a portable antenna, it's one of the chameleon impasse antennas yeah. anyways so i and i went through every single band and got and heard nothing i guess there was these channels that the discord people told me to try because there's a ding every so many seconds from some i don't know some clock in colorado uh nothing nothing so um I don't even know where to, I guess, I don't know where my problem is to start, but I don't have any of this, uh, these things in the line. Like that's why I linked the thing in the line, whether or not it's going to help me measure because the one on my radio is, it was telling me I had a, an S of eight and I don't know if that's good or bad. It sounded bad. So. What radio do you have, Justin? 991A. Yesu. And, uh. You should hear with just a wire in the back, a wire thrown out in the yard, stuck into the coax connector. You should just hear nothing but bags of signals on all bands. You'll hear a lot of noise, but uh, I, had I just got an antenna thrown in the trees, and man, I can hear just tons of stuff. So, yeah. so you, 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 you checked at 10 and 15 megahertz, and you didn't hear the, uh, the beacon, the time? Correct. Okay. Another question. So I'm doing, I got, there's like four different things that could be going wrong, including operator error. So I don't even know where to, I didn't know where to narrow it even down. So this was back in May and I just haven't even looked at it since then because it's just too frustrating to even know they where to start. The factory default. I did that actually mm -hmm. on the weekend, but now the ground is frozen. So I can't pound the stake into the ground anyways, because yeah. it's, a, it's a portable antenna, right? So uh, I, I think it was Jim trying to say something. Yeah, when you connect the antenna, does the noise level go up or not? Just noise, atmospheric noise. With the antenna disconnected, you connect it. Does the noise level go up or does it stay the same? I, I can't recall. It was it was in May, like okay. I said. So first thing to test. It, it sounds Justin like uh, uh, a house call is in order from one of us. And, uh, yeah. 
Uh, or at least a, or at least a zoom meeting um you know a zoom to sort of see what what's going on kind of just a visit to the shack justin because uh yeah no we just got it's it's just some little some little thing that uh, we got to get straightened out for you uh, yeah, Justin as well. I, um, I would not mind at all. Uh, you know, like uh, like you say, writing things down, taking it slow. Uh, try this, try that, and uh, I can certainly look up the manual for the nine ninety one. If you want to do a phone call, or any one of one of us would do that. Sit on a landline with you and uh, and uh, check anything out. So if you want to do that, whenever you have time, uh, for gosh sakes, uh, you know, get a hold of us. But, uh, okay. Any last comments on tuners before, uh, uh, or the, the thing is, uh, I should say, matching networks? Actually, um, I pretty much figured out all of my issues that I was having. I, I also have an AT100 and a 7300 radio, just like Nero. Um, my questions were more like, uh, uh, where do you tune? Like, I want to... I want to work a net on 7100. Now I'm obviously, I can't tune on 7100. So where do I go? Do I go to 7101? That's too, too close probably. I go to 7110, <laughs> but Keep yeah, going. <laughs> I figured all that out. Yeah. Um, then the other question I had was I left it kind of an auto mode on 14, on 1400 on, on the 20 meter band. And I'd call somebody and I'd watch my waterfall and all of a sudden the blue lines would just kind of stop. It would go solid and, and everything went quiet. So obviously the tuner was trying to tune up a little bit better maybe, but didn't quite get there when I was calling. I wasn't calling long enough. So I've learned now just to not have it on auto mode and have it fully manual and just tune properly somewhere where I need to be and then uh, leave it on manual mode. And that, that seems to work the best. And uh, what were the other things? Uh, that's probably about it. Um, kind of worked that all out gradually, just like you said, get the manual out and bang away at it until you figure out what to do with it. But... Yeah, that auto mode is a real gotcha. Um, and the, the, S, the uh, uh, what the heck, it, not to S, uh, there's another auto tuner, uh, manufacturer and I have one of the little ones and man you have to take that auto auto mode because just the slightest change your antenna blows in the breeze or whatever and goes click 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 and there goes your QSO so uh, yeah you learn that once uh, once you learn it once right exactly yeah <laughs> right on well I didn't know what it was doing I thought it was like it's a used unit and I thought maybe it was malfunctioning so I actually wrote to, to uh, LDG and asked them and they said, oh, that sounds weird. It shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> but uh, I guess it's normal. <laughs> uh, to be fair, Peter, um, there's some of the tuners that if you have a solid antenna, like, you know, 80 meter antenna, and it's not going to move around on you, um, some of these tuners will follow you along the band. So in other words, you can QSY, and if it's understood it before, uh, and you put the least bit of RF, it'll grab it and pick and tune that place, and you don't have to do anything. So um, you don't have to press tune buttons or anything. So that's the idea of the automatic. If it works fine, that's great. It'll It'll go and uh, all you got to do is just like a, a little whistle or just a little poop on you know on the microphone and it'll tune for you so it's worth trying if it works it works okay thank you peter also. ari for sharing that uh, that's uh, i wasn't aware of that uh, that feature that sometimes is not a a help yeah. but uh, it's good to know it took, my issues okay. were all just how to how to actually use the thing because I understood the mechanics and the physics and, the, and, and all that, what it was trying to do, just didn't know how to actually do it on air. <laughs> so, well, that's that's how you learn, I guess. And uh, now you're you're an expert on it. So the next guy comes along, and you know, we'll 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 say, oh, we need to talk to Peter. He's already crossed that bridge. <laughs>